Welcome everyone to Music and Mediation. Um, what happened? Okay. In the next hour or so, more or less, I will be speaking of the correlations between music and mediation and trying to argue that mediation is music. Uh, I will also speak about my empirical research and my attempts to use music as a part of the mediation setting and about the other simple tools that I have been trying to develop in the past few years when I started using, using music um, to train mediators. So I've developed, I developed a series of tools, a series of techniques to uh, help mediators in their trainings, but the use of music in the mediation session setting is a whole other history. Uh, I like this quote from Frank Zappa because music is the best, at least it is for me, right? And so I put it at the very beginning of my presentation. Uh, but what it is so special about music? Well, when we mediate, uh, we appeal to certain characteristics of human nature, which are universal. Um, unmet needs, needs that are to be met, the necessity of creating bonds and trust uh, to find common grounds that unite op opposing parties. Uh, we deal about emotions in all of their spectrum and we deal with the profound human need and urge to, heard, to be heard and to be understood. So I asked myself whether music, uh, which is my natural dimension for, because of my upbringing and for biographical reasons, I asked myself if music could help my work as a mediator. So what are we going to talk about? We are going to talk briefly about a bit of ancient history we are going to talk about rhythm and pulse and how this could be really helpful in our mediation practice. Of course, we are going to, to talk about emotions because music and emotions are linked. And then uh, I will gladly offer a glimpse of what I think it is the future of music and mediation. So um, music is part of human nature. Right. Every civilization that we know of, but even before civilization as we now know it, every human culture had, has had, has music. Uh, it is still disputed, but it appears that the oldest musical instrument discovered so far is the Neanderthal flute, recently found in the cave of Divie Babe in Slovenia which is supposed to date back to 50,000 years ago, 50. So not yesterday, 50. And some of you might be familiar with the famous anecdote about the anthropologist, uh, the illustrious anthropologist, Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead uh, was asked by a student about the first evidence of civilization. What was, in her opinion, the first evidence of civilization? And Mead said that the first evidence of civilization was a 15 years old fractured femur found in an archaeological site. The femur is the bone, the bone that linked uh, the hip to the knee. And uh, in societies without the benefit of modern medicine, it takes about six weeks for a fractured femur to heal. So this particular bone had been broken and had healed. This means that someone devoted time and energy to take care of the injury of the injured. Uh, contrary to what normally happens in the animal world when where uh, a wounded animal is left to its own destiny. So if we consider these conclusions, Margaret Mead's conclusions, and we see that traces of the musical activity can be dated some 35,000 year, years before that, then we must consider the hypothesis that music relates to some very fundamental and basic component 
of our humanity. Who knows whether music, the needs for music uh, has a place in the Maslow's pyramid of needs, possibly somewhere at the very basis of it. Who knows? Uh, it's just an idea. Uh, well, uh, a musician, a Slovenian musician, Juben Dimperovsky, played a clay replica of the Neanderthal flute. And quite surprisingly, the pitches that such an instrument can play correspond to our diatonic scale, the scale that we usually use uh, for making music. The diatonic scale is the do, re, mi, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. This is the diatonic scale. Of course, some scientists dismissed such occurrence as a coincidence, and some other scientists dismissed the, uh, the whole idea that the bone was a flute. They say that it's just a chewed bone. Uh, of course, I do not have the scientific knowledge to corroborate one idea instead of the other, but I leave you to the performance of Albinoni's Adagio, by Lumen Dimkarowski, which is impressive. It is play on the replica of a 50,000 years old flute. And for me, is highly emotional. Now, I just want to... Uh, video? Okay, just a minute. So how was it, right? <laughs> when we mediate, we really uh, try to appeal to our true nature, our desire to live in peace, to solve problems, to our compassionate nature, to something that is very fundamental in our human nature. And I think that music must have some part in it. Otherwise, I want to explain that uh, some very ancient uh, man in the caves around uh, a fire devo would devote time uh, de to uh, playing music. Why would they? But anyway, let's proceed. These are just suggestions, you know, because it's a work in progress, my research on this subject. Until very recently in our history, music had to be played live. If you wanted some music, you had to play or sing yourself. Uh, there were no means of recording the sounds except for some rudimental music boxes or instruments like that. Therefore, music was mainly an activity, something that you engaged in, you participated in, in actively. And even when people attended musical events, uh, those had very important social or ritualistic component in it, something that unites individuals. 
On the contrary, nowadays, for the most part, music is made available to us individually. And even more in a way that isolate us from the rest of the world through a headset. If I think of myself, the most of the time I spend listening to music, I listen in, I'm listening to music through my headset. So I'm alone in my own world. And this is the landscape of the approach to music has changed. Uh, this is also something that I have experienced firsthand in my trainings, uh, music and mediation. Uh, I noticed that people of a certain age are generally more comfortable when I ask them to engage in some kind of musical activity or exercise involving music. And I figured that this is because they were used to play and sing in their youth at school or in various kinds of social gatherings. I can recall myself in my youth when there was almost always a guy with a guitar wherever I went. Uh, not so much these days. And this is something to keep in mind when you offer some kind of musical experience. The landscape of the approach to music has changed. Now, what about rhythm? I would like to share with you another brief, very brief, video. Okay. Chose, tout le travail, tout le bruit, c'est des rythmes. All right, everything is rhythm, and rhythm is everywhere, right? Um, you know, uh, when we hear a distant beat, we are led to follow it. It's our instinct. Now you're following this one. Can you hear that? Even if you don't want to, it's our instinct. So, here we are. Sorry. Um, we as mediator need to make the parties focus on the future. We need to make the parties move forward because sometimes they're stuck in the conflict in, in the past. But uh, you know what? Rhythm, the pulse can never get stuck and it never goes backwards. So 
when they tell you that you should manage your time in mediation, what are we really talking about? Because, um, you know, sometimes time is too big of a concept and it's difficult to understand. While rhythm is something tangible and it can help you. Because everything that is alive has a rhythm. Uh, the, the first rhythm that we listen to is our heartbeat, even before we are born our heartbeat and our mother's heartbeat. So when we are in mediation and we have the feeling that the parties are stuck and you do not know what to do, you just rhythm, you just listen to your rhythm and adjust it if it's needed. I want to be clear, I advise you against, against, be clear, doing this during your mediation sessions because it's annoying, right? But it's a useful tool for, to yourself. You, if you can anchor your rhythm somehow, then you can retrieve it when you need it. And immediately you are centered. You can again be in control of the process. Right? And this is very important because um, in mediation you have, to move all together. If you are centered and the parties are not, it's one thing, but if the parties are not centered and you are neither, that's a disaster, right? You cannot allow it. So it's useful for me to be centered on something that keeps you grounded, that is tangible, especially when you're working with parties in conflict. It can be really helpful. And if this whole idea of the rhythm that grounds you um, seems strange, just think about it. When you are in big troubles, what do you do? You take a big breath, right? As if you were to restart your heart, to restart your rhythm, to pump more oxygen into your blood. So, uh, it is very important that you can con have con control and be aware of your own rhythm. And some musical exercise can help you do that. No, no doubt about it. And this is also very important because when you are focused on rhythm, you are less prone to judge and more to observation. And the, why is this? This is because uh, the uh, neuropathway there are implied when you listen or when you think of a rhythm. You are forced to use certain part, parts of your brain that uh, otherwise you wouldn't be using. Uh, and I know that in right at this moment I am oversimplifying a very complex thing uh, but this is how it works. This is how our brain works. And then, of course, because rhythm has a, a vibrational nature, it vibrates, it resonates, it can communicate itself. And I want you to show something else. Uh, there, there is a very famous experiment. I'm sure most of you already know it. It was Jugend's experiment using um, pendulum clocks, right? Uh, due to the clocks transferring energy to, to each other via a coupling bar in the form of mechanical vibration, Jugend achieved the, the um, synchronization of the clocks. I found uh, a different version of this uh, experiment with metronomes. And I want to show you that. It's amazing. Wait. Okay. Look.
You have the idea, right? Uh, I always think of this experiment when I deal with some part in mediation which are, who are um, tenacious in their conflict. <laughs> you just have to reach a critical mass of good rhythm, of good vibration, and then, well, anyway, uh, in mediation, especially when we train mediators, we focus a lot on language, which is good. I am a fan of, of uh, focusing, focusing on language. I'm a fan of nonviolent communication, so it's good. But you also have to keep in mind that when you mediate, you deal with some subtle uh, signals with the with some less uh, evident signals, which are very important nonetheless. So you uh, should be as the bar under the metronome, which floats and makes the uh, vibrational partners communicate to one another without interrupting the communication, right? Just an idea where we, we can elaborate on that. And then, of course, uh, uh, music and emotion are linked. How could they not? Okay, emotion. All right. Uh, you know, um, in agogics, meaning uh, uh, the rhythm of music, the, the classical music is expressed in Italian, allegro, lento, veloce. Here in the picture you have andante grazioso, which is uh, going with grace or moving with grace, moving with ease. Uh, of course, it reflects the mood, it reflects emotions. Uh, my mentor, Isabella Buzzi, once said that emotions are the soundtrack of mediation. And since then, this has become one of my favorite quotes. Uh, as mediators, we deal with emotions in our sessions and we are equipped with an array of tools and techniques, um, mirroring, reframing, rephrasing, asking questions and so on. Music is certainly linked to emotions. And my question is whether music could become part of the mediation setting. And if so, how? Uh, apart from the social component of music and the fact that it naturally creates a social bond, is there some universal feature of music connected to emotions that can be used in the mediator's work? Personally, I only have empirical experience, anecdotal experience of the advantages of using music in the mediation setting. I use music in group mediation uh, where the people were together with a common goal. They shared some views of the world, uh, but they had some conflict to solve. And I used music as a, an introduction to the mediation session in order to create the right ambience. And at the end of each session as a farewell until the next time. I think that that was useful, but again, I only had uh, practical experience so far. But before I go on, Andrea. Andrea? Yes. Yes. Do we have uh, the guest that you were talking to me about? No, <clears throat> unfortunately. unfortunately is not. Okay. But I can share the story if you want to. Uh, yes, please. 
or it um i was uh when we were in the waiting room or before the webinar um i shared with francesca the st story from esther oman um some some of you know her from last uh, week's webinar she's a winner of a peace award in cameroon she's a very brave woman who works with armed groups and empowers women in her society and she's doing a lot of uh, mediation and after our webinar last time we were sitting together Alex um, Esther and I in, in ritual of course in this room and she told us that she would sing in her mediations she comes in as a mediator and she would sing and she uh, she said she has peace songs and the peace songs are this is not one peace song and uh, they differ um, depending on the situation and it's a uh, kind of spontaneous music that she um, that she presents and we ask her to to sing uh, I, said, oh, I can't imagine and she, she started to sing this song for us and I tell you that afterwards I cried but really like uh, tears uh, it was not only a little wet in my eyes it touched me so much it was just the energy I mean she's uh, like a, an, an extraordinary woman anyways with a huge aura but when she sang you could feel it even in a in a in a in a room like that and i could totally imagine how th this would be in a mediation and how yes. this could also create an atmosphere of openness yeah. yes and uh, in a sense this is what we were trying to do at the very beginning of this webinar when you put a, a song on to create the right atmosphere, right? To, yes, to create that sense of openness. Yeah. And uh, after that, you will tell us if it worked. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, I only had an experience, empirical experience so far until I found a study. And this is the study. Uh, a research about uh, Alan S. Coven and others published in 2012. What music makes us feel at least uh, 13 dimensions organize subjective experiences associated with music across different cultures. Published on the journal Proceedings of National Academy of Science in the US. So this paper answers to two fundamental questions. Do our subjective experiences when listening to music show evidence of universality? And if so, what is the nature of these experiences? Because music is said to be um, the language of the soul, ca seemingly capable of expressing what words cannot. But is this language really universal? For this research, uh, uh, more than 2,500 people were, in, were, were involved. There were 1,591 participants from the US and 1,258 Chinese participants who listened to more than 2,000 music samples. And uh, I would like, uh, these are the 13 uh, um, dimension that they found distinct varieties of subjective experience, amusing, annoying, anxious, beautiful, calm, dreamy, energizing, and so on. But I would like you to show a scheme of this research, which is really, really impressive. Okay, where is it? Here. Okay. Uh, uh. I, I will leave you the link afterwards. So these are the results of this study. Those are the samples. Stop. Okay, but there's one thing in particular that I want to, to, um, to notice. So these that you can see on your screen are all ratings. And then look at the USA participant and then the Chinese participant. Look at this graphic here, up right, USA, China, 
as you can see, there is almost no difference, which is incredible. Of course, this study is only the beginning. Um, the study is limited to two cultures. We are waiting for further study to investigate other culture. And uh, there are many limits to the study, but still, uh, it might be too soon for us as mediator to, to venture in this unknown territory to use music as a granular tool in mediation, but this possibility might be not too far ahead. And I'm excited about it. You know, uh, in the study, they say that, for instance, if I am from Italy, if I listen to uh, Araga from Hindustan, I might not perceive the nuances, but I perceive the general meaning of the music. So the native would uh, uh, perceive uh, uh, more granularity with more granularity than me, but there is still uh, some uh, suggestions that it could be really a universal language. Uh, but we are still in the early stages because this study is from 2012, 2020, and we'll see. And then I'd like to offer a glimpse on the future of music and mediation. Okay which involves neuroscience and quantum physics. So I'm not a quantum physicist, so please uh, allow me some indulgence <laughs> on this. But anyway, for this part of the webinar, I will be largely referring to John W. Cooley's seminal work, Music Mediation and Superstrings. Uh, you know, um, we can all agree that music is a good metaphor for mediation. And even in our everyday language, you, we use sentences like uh, to create harmony, to investigate discord, to be in tune, to be out of tune. And I'm not a native English speaker. I, I'm sure that you can come up with more of these examples. But we usually, we commonly use uh, music as a metaphor. Cooley does that too. Uh, uses a music as a, as a metaphor for, mediate, for mediation, and he says, and I'm quoting him, him, whether or not you ultimately agree with the thesis that of this article, of his article, that mediation is music, perhaps you will be able to accept that music serves as a useful metaphor to describe mediation and to acquire insight into the mediation process and the role of the mediator. Then uh, Cooley compares music and mediation, finding a high degree of similarity, which I have roughly and with lots of inaccuracy summarized here. As you can see, the sound in music are, is the, uh, are the information in mediation, the tone of music are the patterns of mediation, the melody are the themes, metaphors and stories, the harmony in music are in mediation compatible interest, the composition, the strategy and so on. But let's jump out from the metaphorical angle and jump in in a physical one. The neuroscience part of, the, of our future. So music or more, accur more accurately playing music is the only known activity so far that engages both hemispheres of our brain, both at the same level of activity. When we say uh, mediate with the right brain, or when we think outside the box, when we appeal to creativity and most importantly to observation instead of judgment, uh, we are in fact trying to activate the other side of our brain or parts of our brain that we do not usually uh, put in use. But music does that naturally. Up to this day, no other human activity has proven to open such an incredible possibility. You know, uh, from a neurological point of view, listening to music uh, is a problem-solving activity. 
think about it. When you listen to music, in fact, you are invested with a lot of information. There is rhythm, there is sounds, there is pitches, there is melody, which is different pitches one after the other. You receive all this information and your brain puts it together and says, oh, it's music. So is it possible that those who are accustomed to listening to music or to music are more prone to a problem solving attitude? I don't know, maybe, who knows? <laughs> it has also been proven that people studying music from a young age have an increased volume and activity of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the bridge between the two hemispheres. So uh, when we mediate, we try hard to put our party from using only one hemisphere to use the other, to involve both of the hemisphere. Is, it, is that possible that musicians are in a way wired differently and more uh, suitable for mediation? Well, no, everyone is suitable for mediation, but you know, it's just speculation. And uh, Mediation is music from a point of view because uh, going back to Cooley, the super string theory posits that the ultimate, ultimate building blocks of nature consist of infinitesimal vibrating strings. So everything in the universe has an inherent uh, uh, vibrational pattern, probability vibrational pattern. This leads us to conclude that while music has always been used as a metaphor for describing everything that exists, think about it, from the music of the spheres to the gods that sang the universe into existence, music, given our limited human senses, could be more than just a metaphor, could be the closest description we could ever achieve of the description of what it is, of, of everything that exists. And in the search, of, the search for harmony of a common vibrational pattern, mediation is music. <laughs> so this is where my experience and my research has led me so far. And I'm sharing my vision, hoping that others will add to that. And this is not a conclusion for me, but just the beginning. And here is some reading list, some multimedia list, and really, grazie di cuore, which means a heartfelt thank you to all of you, and especially to International Mediation Mediator Campus wow. for this opportunity. Grazie mille, Francesca. Grazie mille. <laughs> it was... Uh, um... So interesting. I do you, do you have I'm sure there is a lot of question discussions. I already saw a comment in the chat. Emanuela, uh, you said a mediator as an orchestra director. Right? Yes. If, is, is that the picture? Um, so do you have any questions, any comments uh, to Francesca? Let's open the floor for that. You know, mediation is more like a jam session where everyone improvises, but there is a, a pattern and you have to stick to it. Otherwise, it's just confusion, right? And the mediator makes sure that everyone improvises within a given uh, pattern, a scheme, process. Brita. Thank you very much. This was incredible, really. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you. I, I missed it. Obviously, we played a your you or Andrea played a song beforehand. Is that what you do in the beginning of your mediation sessions? That you play some music, or don't you do that at all? You just feel the music in your heart and you try and make the parties feel that rhythm as well. Precisely, yes, I do it for myself because I uh, would need to know the parties in advance and to know them mm. very well. 
because if you put on the wrong music, yes. that's the end. Yeah. Can you please share the link? Yes, it's in the media library, but I can share it in the chat if you want to. Yeah. Look at, I, uh, oh, sorry, can... sorry. <laughs> What, no, 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 I, Britta, I, I wanted just to, uh, to answer. I have done that. I have played music. Uh, it was like for bigger groups. And I have yes. also done that um, like in, in um, not in between, but you know, when there was a pause. And I have also, I, 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 mm. it, it was an inspiration of one of my German colleagues, actually. He's doing that and he's also doing that in seminars. And it was yes. uh, my own experience when I came to his seminar. Mm. It was about the technique of doubling. <laughs> and I, I wanted to know more. Yeah. And we came into the room and there was this music. And I had the feeling that, that the dynamic changed so much uh, between mm. the participants. And also you, you, you left everything that you uh, experienced before, you know, the rush and, and, and running in there. And, and so it, it just felt apart and you were kind of um, empty in a way, but in a positive way. And uh, this, so it was my own experience. It was not a mediation, but a seminar. So I used it and I, I always, and I, I'm trying to use kind of neutral music that is not heavy metal or <laughs> that ha doesn't have words that could offend someone, but just to relax, more relaxing music. Uh, not, not always, but I have done that. Yeah. And this is also only listening to music. Imagine if you involve the parties with some kind of musical activities. It's mind blowing, really. You know what? What I was I was participating in a project because in my former former career <laughs> I was working for a university that uh, that taught um, music. Uh, it was uh, also about popular music, and we had a project going on, and that was for leader, a leadership training, and it made the leaders uh, playing in a band, and it was especially for teams that were like the in 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 change, and for teams they had some conflicts, and there were musicians coming, and they taught um, the, the the people who didn't play at all an instrument, like some easy chords, some easy uh, um, uh, melodies, and so on. And in the end of a day, it was one day of workshop kind of team building, they put a song together and they performed it on stage. And this was an incredible experience. And also it, it uh, yeah, it bonded them so much. And um, that was, that was also, it was not exactly a mediation, but it was also for team critical situations where music was the tool, yeah. No, there is a lot, a lot of studies about music creating social bonds. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Yes. It's good. Britta. Uh, sorry, me again. <laughs> but you showed that, that little video of, of the rhythms and the African yeah. drums and the way he hacked the tree, which I found very sad, but that's besides the point. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that and I'm living in Africa. And when I have my, my um, lectures and when I have like a, a workshop that is rather long, then very often in between, the participants actually ask, can we sing something or can we dance something? And it, yes. I think it's in, in our, and I call myself an African, in our blood to do that. Yes. But I think maybe in, in the Western world, In the Western world, world we have, not so much. We have forgotten. No, we that. lost it. Yes, yeah. and above all, we have lost the connection between music and our body. In the Western world, in Italy, in, the, in Europe, I mean, in my world. Music mm. is one thing and the body is, is another thing, which is totally unnatural. Yeah. And how is that then, Britta? What do you sing? Or is there like a standard song? Or is some, somebody starts to sing? Is it something made up? I, I would be really in, interested in, in a dynamic. Like um, it's, it's usually in, in the, the language that I do not understand, but I know that mostly these are religious songs because I have asked, you know, what it is and, and I can even, you know, like say a few words in that language and I can already hum the, the song, but it's usually a very 
uplifting and, and nice beat and people wake up from that. And then when they sit down, we can continue. So it is mostly religious mm -hmm. and everyone can sing it and they can all harmonize fantastically, which we can't, you know, most of us that haven't sung in a choir or so, they just do it out of their hearts and it's yeah. absolutely amazing. But you know, there is a, a whole branch of medicine uh, that deals with um, music and medicine, music uh, for recovery in a variety of uh, instances. Uh, it's a scientific fact. So we have to promote uh, another scientific branch of uh, music and mediation. <laughs> so our uh, uh, concrete experience can be shared at a mass, more, um, can be disseminated, right? Do you have more comments, questions, stories to tell? Maybe you have a story, an experience about conflict and mediation, yourself experience music in a um, difficult situation. Okay. There's a Have you had a negative reaction from Parson when music is played? No, because I'm very careful. And so far, I've always used uh, media, uh, music in uh, group mediation, uh, which means that I know the group, I know their um, habits. Maybe they, they already have a repertoire, so I can understand them. But um, really, the wrong music can trigger some something very negative <laughs> can close doors instead of opening them. Uh, so it I must be chosen very carefully. Oh, sorry, there was something. Um, I uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Anat. Um, I'm, I'm actually an amateur musician who uh, um, I dedicate about 14 hours of my month uh, to music in a group that actually performs a, a cappella group. And I've also uh, had a jazz group, etc. So I, I really, it really resonates with me. Um, and I would be very curious to kind of see where your research uh, takes you. Help uh, me. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, one thing that comes from jazz, and I think there's been some work about jazz and negotiation, etc., is yes. really form, and that's something that for me helps me a lot to, because uh, there's a lot of mess sometimes in our mediation room, and a lot of things that sometimes maybe may seem kind of chaotic even, and 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 that also happens in jazz, but actually there's a form in jazz and- uh, And, and uh, beauty. And, and yeah, of course. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, for me, from my experience, it, sometimes it helps me to, to recenter myself and the process to go back to the form. Okay, so this is what we're doing here. And that also applies to small mediations, but also to large group mediations that are even messier. So that's one thing. And also the issues of uh, dissonance and discord is something that really, I think is really helpful uh, to think because, uh, uh, you know, s someone else may call it subtext, but something, but you can hear it also as discord or dissonance. So thank you so much. Thanks to you.